So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome on behalf of the National Electric Manufacturers Association. Uh, I'm Evan Gaddis, the President and CEO of NEMA. Uh, NEMA represents the 400 plus electrical manufacturers that make your products safer, smarter, and more efficient. Now, I understand that we've got a long line up at security, but we're going to go ahead and move on and let people join us later. I want to thank all of you for coming today. Uh, I think there was a big scare out here about the storm hitting right now, but I understand it's going to come a little bit later. But what's good is we're going to be talking about storms and disasters <laughs> here. Now, as we mark the beginning of the 2013 hurricane season, it's critical that we reflect on the devastation caused by last fall's Superstorm Sandy and the lessons that we can learn for preparedness, recovery, and mitigation of the next disaster or derocha. Perhaps more than any storm in recent history, Sandy reminded us of the critical tie between infrastructure, comfort, and recovery. With many areas subject to weeks and months without power, this horrible storm became an even more horrible ordeal for the millions of affected Americans. Over 7.5 million hit the peak of the storm. And while no disaster is predictable or preventable, we have technology available today to mitigate the damage and the distress that storms like Sandy can cause. In fact, NEBA represents over 400 of the country's electrical manufacturers who are constantly innovating new products proven to help improve reliability, resilience, and energy efficiency through the entire power system. Now today, we'll talk about the response to Sandy and how we can use smart preparedness and rebuilding strategies to help ensure the resilience and restoration of our critical power supplies with smart meters, self-healing technologies, backup generation, and microgrids, we can drastically reduce the negative effects of disasters and storms. We must build and we must rebuild smart. Now to kick off this event, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Representative Peter King. Now, Chairman King is serving his 11th term in Congress, representing South Central Long Island, an area devastated by Sandy's impact. And during his years in Congress, Chairman King has attained a reputation for being well-informed and independent. And following the ravages of Sandy, he led the successful fight in Congress to obtain over $60 billion in emergency funding for the victims of the storm. And he continues his tireless service on the House Energy Preparedness Response and Communications Subcommittee. Without further delay, I want to thank the chairman for joining us today and ask if you'd talk a little bit about Sandy and what we can do in the future. Thank you very much, uh, General Gaddis. It's a privilege to be here today. I want to uh, thank NEMA for the outstanding work that it does and the work that I look forward to you doing in the future because uh, as this afternoon is just a vivid reminder of the storms that we seem to be anticipating with the changing weather patterns. We're trying to begin to understand, but all I know is things are changing and weather patterns are changing. And uh, it was certainly on uh, last year in New York and New Jersey, uh, mass destruction from uh, Sandy, both in New York and, and New Jersey. So let me just, if I could, touch a bit on that, what happened in Congress, how we had to fight to get the monies, and probably most importantly, what we're trying to do for the future. Uh, I've lived on Long Island, either in Queens or Nassau, uh, my entire life. Uh, we've never had a storm like Sandy. In fact, the worst you would have, even during the bad hurricanes, you may have a community or two which flooded. Uh, you may have had damage to some homes, but nothing that ever brought a, uh, uh, the whole region to a halt. And yet, last year from Sandy, we had over 2 million uh, New Yorkers, 2.2 million New Yorkers lost their power. And that was anywhere from <clears throat> several days to several weeks. And to make it worse, for instance, on Long Island, where the Long Island Power Authority is in charge, 86% of the uh, uh, power was lost. 86% of the homes lost power. And yet, what made it worse is LIPA had no way of knowing when the power was coming back. People would call. There was total frustration. Panic was starting to set in. Uh, they, they had no overall computer ability at all to uh, determine. There was no smart systems technology. There was no, uh, uh, no way for them to give any advice at all. So, and this is more than just convenience we're talking about. Where people, we're talking about families who had six peop uh, sick people living at home uh, on uh, respirators, uh, young children who were disabled, 
who required uh, around-the-clock medical attention. It was important for their families to know when they could expect to have power restored. If not, they would just leave the region and find a relative who lived in some other state. They couldn't get any of that information. Uh, and uh, so this is something as we go forward that we certainly have to uh, find a way. LIPA, uh, I know Governor Cuomo wants to drastically restructure it and change it. But no matter how it's changed, they have to make more of an investment in technology, not have this outdated computer system. But I'm jumping ahead. Let me go back to when it happened. And uh, it really was over a period of a day and a half that the damage hit. And uh, again, I never saw anything like it. Uh, we had whole communities. Uh, Dina from my staff is here uh, where uh, her family lives in Lido Beach. It was just decimated. Uh, you have a community such as Island Park, which was where Senator D'Amato came from. More than half the people lost their homes or, or uh, driven out of their homes. Many of them are still out. Now we're talking about seven months later, still have not been able to go back to their homes. Uh, the whole South Shore, from the whole Lindenhurst, Massapequa, <coughs> Seaford area, any of you familiar with that, were absolutely devastated. And uh, my experience with hurricanes since in the 20 years I've been in Congress was mainly voting to send money to Louisiana and Florida and Texas and uh, Mississippi. Uh, when they had their storms, uh, primarily uh, uh, Katrina. I remember with Katrina, when that hit in uh, 2005, uh, within uh, four days we appropriated $11 billion. In the next six days we appropriated another $54 billion. So that was $64 billion, uh, $65 billion in uh, 10 or 11 days was appropriated for Katrina. Uh, in, uh, when it came to New York and New Jersey, and our devastation was, I believe, in many ways worse than Katrina. Uh, it, we got nothing in November, nothing in December. So that's 60 days right there. It wasn't until the end of January that the money was finally approved. <clears throat> and it only was approved because we had to have a concerted effort by New York and New Jersey, by Governor Christie and Governor Cuomo, by the senators, particularly New York Senator Schumer, Senator, Senator Gillibrand, and all the members of the congressional delegation to working together but if any of you remember what was going on in the House floor, uh, there was really no intention to vote this money for New York and New Jersey. Congress was going to uh, recess or adjourn for the year, and it would have taken months and months and months. We had to really bring it to public attention. We had to fight it on the House floor. And finally, we were able to get $61 billion. But again, that was almost 100 days after, almost 100 days after uh, the storm. Now, the st uh, to get any of the money to come in, uh, certainly the uh, community uh, development block grants, which were a key part of it, the governors had to submit plans to Washington. And they required 45 days for comment. So we're talking about <clears throat> really the end of April, beginning of May, before the major amount of the money started to come in. FEMA money was coming in prior to that. But uh, that, again, is really minimal in the overall picture. The big uh, uh, dollars come from the uh, community uh, development block grants. Now. Let me just describe part of what it was like living on Long Island during those days. Here we are in Long Island, uh, certainly parts of Queens, Brooklyn. Uh, gas stations, I would say 80, 90 percent of the gas stations uh, lost their power. And it's going to be so vital as in the future to have uh, backup generation. I mean, that, uh, to go that long without uh, power meant no gasoline for automobiles. The few gas stations that were open, you had three and four hour lines. You had fights breaking out on the lines. You can imagine, and then panic was starting to set in. And then you had people topping off, uh, going every day to make sure they had their gas. So you had all, and then the rumors coming in. Uh, I just saw a story the other day, <clears throat> uh, apart from the, uh, uh, the gasoline, that New York City almost lost 60 percent of its food supply because what would happen at Hunts Point. Uh, I can tell you also the health situation that Nassau County in particular was in contact with uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, because of the sewage that was backing up and the disease that they were afraid was going to come from that. So just envision this. Here we are in the 21st century in the most significant metropolitan area in the universe, probably, the New York metropolitan area, New Jersey. Uh, you had a situation where there was uh, uh, very little gasoline. Over 80 percent of the homes were without power. There was a potential of losing our food supply and the spread of disease. And this, again, is 21st century. It was more like a third world situation. Also, you realize during this time that you are on an island. You know, we don't think of it that way, but uh, Nassau, Suffolk, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, all islands. And uh, so we were really cut off from, you know, from the world. And without power, there was no television. It was really, uh, uh, again, there was a few days in there 
where, uh, and I give the elected officials, the local elected officials credit for keeping things calm and under control, but we were in a very desperate situation. So obviously the money is coming in. We have to repair the damage that was done, but uh, certainly I remember from the early days meeting with Governor Cuomo, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, County Executive Mangano in uh, Nassau County, how they have to prepare for the future. There has to be uh, uh, mitigation. Yes, spend money on repairs, but to repair something and rebuild it only to have it destroyed in the next storm makes no sense. So uh, the mitigation is absolutely essential, and that's where I believe NEMA is particularly important. Let me just put in a plug for the NEMA Storm Restoration Guide and website. That is, as we go forward, is going to be particularly important. Here you go. You got it. Okay. Very good. No, because I, I can tell you, uh, I've been in local government for a number of years. I've been in federal government now for 20 years. And I think very little thought, certainly in my part of the country, the Northeast, was put into mitigation because, again, you're spending money which people felt would never be needed. You're spending money on, uh, for a major storm. Which the last time we had one in Long Island, for instance, was 1938. So why bother putting money in uh, to something that may not hit you for 75 years? And then how bad could it be? Well, we found out how bad it could be. And now with the changing weather patterns, we realize that could also happen today, tomorrow. It could happen next year. And roughly, I would say for every dollar that is spent on mitigation, it saves four dollars later on. So there is going to be a concerted effort. I know at the Community uh, Development Block Grants that Governor Cuomo, Mayor Bloomberg, County Executive Mangano, who will be the three main players in New York, they definitely are trying to focus on mitigation. I know, uh, and I don't have the details, but I know Mayor Bloomberg did, they put out a pretty detailed plan about some of the measures he wants taken. Uh, again, uh, Newtown Creek, I know, was one of them, but others uh, to uh, uh, at least minimize, or attempt to minimize some of the damage that uh, we saw the last time. And again, you almost one of those deals, you had to be there to realize how bad it got and how quickly it happened. Uh, and uh, so we never want to be in a position where uh, we're that almost defenseless again. Also, I think it's important for Congress to uh, realize that this is a national responsibility. I consider myself a conservative. I believe that money is best uh, raised and spent at the local level. But that's for issues that and for matters that involve local governments, that can be controlled by local governments. Uh, a natural disaster is beyond the control of anyone. In many ways, I'm not trying to equate the two of them morally at all, but in many ways it's like a terrorist attack. There's nothing a, uh, uh, there's no way a local government can afford to pay the total cost of these uh, damages. And uh, so I think they have to keep in mind, it's not just going to be Florida and Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi that are going to be hit. It could be certainly any part of the country, and now we see the Northeast is a prime target. But also keeping in mind that Congress may not be that generous, and we almost had a twist their arm or break their arms or whatever we had to do to get the money this time. That's why funding put into mitigation now is going to be more important than ever. Because I don't think you're going to see Congress, as we saw this last time, uh, so willing to uh, spend the money as they did in Katrina. I think those days are gone for the foreseeable future, and that's why mitigation is more important now than ever. And uh, so I just want to thank you for having us here today, for uh, the effort that you are putting into this. And I, I hope the day doesn't have to come when we say, thank God for what NEMA did. But I think if the day does come, we are going to say that. Because, uh, this, again, with the changing weather patterns, we can only expect to see more and more of these uh, deadly storms. And uh, I don't want anyone to go through what was uh, the people of New York and New Jersey went through uh, last October. Uh, again, the storm is one thing, but the after effects, the damage, really the inability to, uh, to cope with it, uh, and the Again, near disaster situation we had in the days, uh, I'd say up to about eight or nine days after that storm, we were close to uh, uh, a very desperate situation as far as everything getting out of control. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. Uh, technologies to mitigate are absolutely essential. Uh, thank God there's smart people like you and politicians like me because uh, uh, you have the brains. I can just sort of talk about it. So uh, with that, let me thank you for having me here today, and let me wish you the best. And if anybody wants to ask any questions, yeah, I'll be glad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chairman's got a few minutes for questions. Do we have any? Okay, I can. Okay. Uh oh, there's always one. Okay, uh, here you go. I almost got away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was uh, just like uh, Sandy was the perfect storm. 
it was a perfect storm here in Congress. And uh, now that all of us have cooled down a bit, I think we can reflect on it a bit more. If you recall, we were at the fiscal cliff all through December, uh, where basically the uh, government was going to shut down. Uh, the, uh, uh, it was lock, basically a lockdown between the president and the Democrats on one side, the Republicans on the other. And finally, uh, so this is all through December. Then on January, literally on January 1st, uh, we voted uh, to avoid the fiscal cliff. In doing that, Republicans agreed to uh, eliminate some of the Bush tax cuts. Well, that was considered a real blow to the Republican Party. I thought it was something we had to do. In many ways, we boxed ourselves into that corner. But the bottom line, after all this tension, which is what 90 percent of Congress is focusing on, uh, here you have a, in effect, a tax increase passing Congress, which Republicans were totally against. Now, immediately after that, literally immediately after that, we were supposed to vote on giving $61 billion to New York and New Jersey. So just imagine the optics on the House floor, where you have uh, Republicans who are the majority, very angry that they were pushed into a position they felt of having to vote for a uh, tax increase. And then on top of that, now we're going to send $61 billion to New York and New Jersey. And that was literally 11 o'clock at night. And they just walked off the floor. It wasn't going to be done. And that's where a number of us went to the microphone to keep this alive, because we had actually been working on that bill for a number of days under the radar screen. We've been asked not to overly publicize it, not to make a big issue out of it. And then in return for that, it was going to be voted on as the last bill of the uh, previous Congress. So when it wasn't voted on, we were in a position where if we had waited till the next day, people wouldn't know what we were talking about because people didn't know that we were planning to vote that night because we had kept it quiet, being the good guys. Now we're being penalized for being the good guys. So that's why, if you thought you saw some erratic people on the floor, we were doing it because we wanted to make sure on the morning television shows, people woke up to hear about this. Otherwise, you would have had the next day the Speaker and the new Congress being sworn in, Congress recesses through most of January, then you have the State of the Union. We would have been, and the inauguration, we'd be in February before anything was done. So uh, basically it was horrible, horrible timing uh, and everything coming together at that time. And also there was a lot of myths put out there, and I still hear people say they voted against because of all the pork that was in there. Uh, and the two big examples they use are the roof of the Smithsonian, and the other one is, uh, I guess, the uh, fisheries in Alaska. Uh, first of all, the Smithsonian roof was destroyed in the hurricane. That, to me, is not pork to fix a national museum. Uh, and the fisheries in Alaska, there was a major storm the year before, which Congress was supposed to get deliver the money, didn't, so they were going to attach it to this. It was not pork in any way. Having said that, all of that would have amounted to less than maybe one half of one percent of the total $61 billion. But that's all you were hearing about. Uh, that we shouldn't be putting roofs on museums. Oh, yeah, that, the other one was that uh, they were going to, uh, the money was going to be spent to buy uh, new automobiles for federal employees. Well, these were Homeland Security vehicles that were destroyed in the storm. So, uh, but again, even if all that were true, again, we're talking about such a small, small amount of the overall, so to hold a whole region of the country hostage for less than 1% of the cost was just wrong. But that was out there, it took on a life of its own. This is all the perfect storm. So we had Sandy in October, and we had the perfect storm in Congress on January. And next time, we're going to have to mitigate that in Congress, too. So, so. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, the governor has a plan. I think basically you need an entire new management. Uh, you need, uh, I don't even know how important the structure is per se. I think it should be you know, more responsive, uh, put in a way that's more responsive to elected officials, because that also brings about political influence, but it also, I think, can make them more responsive. They sort of became encased there and uh, immune from, uh, uh, I think, enough public scrutiny. Uh, uh, the main thing, as I see it, because apparently in uh, New Jersey, they didn't have this problem. They had a much better computerized system where they were able to tell people uh, you know, when they could expect their power to come back on. Same in Connecticut. The, mainly, if something, one structural thing has to be done, it's an entirely new computer system so that they can tell uh, what, is, what areas have lost their power, what's, literally what goods have lost their power, and when they're going to be restored. 
uh, you got nothing. You would be told nothing in Long Island. They couldn't tell you within uh, 10 days as to how long it was going to take. Yes? M Mr. Chairman, can you talk a little bit more about what you think Congress's role is in getting more of these mitigation efforts rolling and what is feasible in the near term? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that would <clears throat> mainly a part of the appropriations process. I think it has to be uh, brought out in a way that uh, money is being spent, uh, say, Army Corps of Engineers projects, uh, water projects, uh, beach erosion, which mainly is Army Corps of Engineers. All of that has to be shown that spending money now is going to save money in the future. And that's, that's basically the way it has to be done. I think now we could have a good pilot test with the community development block grants that are coming through and are going to be spent primarily in New York City, I believe. Also, I think Governor Christie has plans for New Jersey. But I do know in New York City, Mayor Bloomberg has an extensive mitigation plan. That can almost be used, hopefully, as a model for the country as to what works and what doesn't work. Hopefully, most of it will work. But uh, again, it's, as you see with any issue in, in Congress, uh, uh, we sort of deal with the issue as it's facing us. I, all, all, right now, all the talk is about the NSA. Well, it's possible a few weeks from now, people won't even be, be concerned about the NSA. It'll be on to the next. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's important for people, I think, in leadership in the Congress to try to maintain the attention span and to, so we're not put in the position where we have these disasters and the long follow-up period. But again, that's, it's going to take leadership from, from all of us. Last question. Someone back there? Or? No? Right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. It's always the last one that kills you. That's why I'm <laughs> getting nervous. Congressman, um, yeah. have you uh, worked with any utilities post-Sandy, um, whether working groups or, um, or you know, direct uh, counseling on, on how better to prepare, um, you know, maybe con, con Ed or anything like that? Actually, my district would be totally uh, covered by LIPA. And there's a mess of restructuring going on there. Governor Cuomo has submitted a proposal. Uh, we did have, on the Homeland Security Committee, uh, we had uh, PSFG in from New Jersey explain what they've done. And uh, I think that's, uh, uh, and I have urged them to be meeting with LIPA, a meeting with you know, people on Long Island to show what was done. Because apparently there was just light years difference between New Jersey and Long Island, and also between Connecticut and Long Island. So, no, uh, my understanding is that the utility companies are meeting. They are uh, doing after-action reports with each other, lessons learned. Uh, but it's, uh, I think with, with LIPA, you're going to see an entirely new structure on, on, on Long Island. And that's, uh, Governor Cuomo was uh, uh, almost at war with LIPA during it. Uh, I guess it was uh, on the Friday after, that would have been 10 days, November 16th, I mean, Congressman Israel and I, held a uh, news conference where we actually asked the uh, Army Corps of Engineers to come in, federal officials to come in and run LIPA. That's how out of control they got, know how ineffective they had become. Uh, I don't want to go through that again. We're asking for actually federal support to come in and run our power authority. So uh, uh, I, th I think a lot of it is there's no magic bullet here, but a new form of LIPA and l uh, lessons learned from adjoining uh, and adjacent uh, uh, utility companies. And again, thank you all for your great work. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thanks to uh, Chairman King for taking time to talk to us about mitigating the, uh, the next storms. And, uh, and I've got to say thank you for what you're doing for your nation right now, especially as uh, you talk about mitigating and, and the work you're doing. And we know you're a leader in that area. On a personal note, I have to say thank you for your service to our nation. I know that you were a member of the uh, New York Army National Guard, and I appreciate it. Thank you, General. Thank you. Thank you. Right now. Thank you all very much. I hope the storm doesn't hit you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So what I'd like to do now uh, for the next few minutes, uh, we want to host a panel discussion on the effects and the impacts of Hurricane Sandy and the implications for future preparedness. Joining me will be Don Hendler, the President and CEO of Leviton Manufacturing Company, and Mr. Brett Brenner, who is the President of the Electrical Safety Foundation International. So starting with Don, he runs Leviton, a NEMA member company. It's one of the largest and most innovative electrical companies in the world. Leviton makes many smart electrical products. And Don Hendler is on the NEMA Board of Governors. 
More important, both Don and his business headquarters are and were located in Sandy's primary impact zone. So at this time, Don, if uh, take a few minutes and please feel free to stand up here or set where you are and either way you want to do it and uh, talk a little bit about what you experienced in mitigation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Evan. As Evan mentioned, Levitin's offices were directly in the path of the storm. <clears throat> and I don't think uh, Congressman King really paid justice to what this storm did. Uh, we're in Melville, New York, which is central Long Island, right at the Nassau-Suffolk border. Uh, our area saw mainly heavy wind and tree damage because we're in the middle of the island. However, uh, what Congressman uh, King neglected to mention was right after Sandy, we had a very freak snowstorm. So whatever trees were left from Sandy, which weren't many, the snowstorm took care of and actually complicated the, uh, the restructuring and getting power back made it even worse. So not far from our facility, there was devastating flooding, affected many of our employees. Some are still affected, as Congressman King said, to this day. There was the immediate storm impact of flooding, fallen trees, down wires, and the aftermath effect of the storm, which was loss of power for days and even weeks. In my residential area where I live, we were without power for 16 days. Levitin is a manufacturing company that started at the dawn of electricity in 1906. And while we're best recognized for our residential switches, receptacles, lighting controls, we also help our customers create sustainable, intelligent environments through not only electrical wiring devices, but also data and network connectivity solutions, lighting and energy management, security and automation applications. And these products include things like electric vehicle chargers, ground fault circuit interrupters and arc fault circuit interrupters, which are vital when you have flooding, daylight harvesting controls, occupancy sensors, smart metering, also very vital, and communication devices. Levitin products, 25,000 strong, help us achieve not only uh, electrical safety, but also electrical savings. As a technology company, and in a recently commissioned facility, which is four years old now, we were better prepared for this storm than most. Our facility had a dual electrical feed. One feed went out. However, the ever other never lost power. This was very lucky for us as a business, but it was a greater benefit to our employees, many of whom brought family members, got meals from our in-house cafeteria, and called Levitin home for several days. However, there are lessons to be learned from the Levitin experience <clears throat> that everyone can benefit from. And I think one of the great quotes came from Jesse Burtz at smartgridnews.com shortly after when NEMA published the Smart Rebuilding Report. Again, another plug for this. If you haven't seen it, it's great reading, and it really tells you what's available and what can be done t for the grid. Um, that publication and what he said, I'll paraphrase, but it was basically we could rebuild the grid to the 1975 standard that existed before the storm, or we can rebuild smart using the latest technologies. Mother Nature will always do her thing, and there's little we can do to prevent whatever she has in mind from occurring. But we can employ smart and new technologies to mitigate the impact and make our homes and communities more resilient. For example, smart grid solutions can easily detect and pinpoint down power lines. This saves time in sending out repair crews, leading to faster restoration times, and can help avoid large-scale outages by rerouting power and localizing the outage. The concept of a smart grid has been around for about 40 years, but the technology to deliver really only started to take hold in the mid-1990s. It was accelerated with the passage of the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Smart Grid takes advantage of sensor and communication technologies in order to deliver more reliable and resilient power. Smart Grid technology not only helps ensure power continuity, but it's also a major driving factor in increasing energy efficiency. Coupled with smart grid technology, sensing and sending information from sensors and smart meters, 
the concept of a microgrid providing distributed power generation and energy storage would serve to further minimize some of the devastating effects of large-scale power outages. Microgrids, which is basically decentralized electricity, utilizing alternative and backup power generation, can provide reliable, cost-effective power for critical high-priority facilities such as hospitals and first responders, but it also can aid homeowners, businesses, and public facilities. Currently available wiring and cabling components also make it possible now to protect power infrastructure from flooding and the after effects of corrosion. Installation of simple receptacles that sense ground arc faults and cut power decrease the danger of shock, electrocution, and fire. Also, Congressman King didn't mention, most of you saw the pictures of Breezy Point, where a hundred some odd homes burned down as the result of electrical shorts. Where technology and improved systems can make a difference, so can common sense. Why shouldn't gas stations, as Congressman King mentioned, have back out power to pump gas to their tanks in times of need? Most of the gas stations on the island after the storm had fuel, they just couldn't get it up for the cars. And of course, everyone's focused that no one had gas for their automobile, but people that were fortunate to have generators that ran on gas couldn't get gas for the generators either, therefore they didn't get power. It also affected, as was mentioned, supermarkets. If they had backup generation, food would not have been wasted. Frozen foods that were thrown out by the tons, excuse me, uh, would have been saved. Other practical things, locating power outside of low-lying areas. Sounds very simple, but wasn't done before the storm. Burying cables were practical. And again, you don't bury cables in a flooded area, but where you can bury cables, trees can't knock them over. It is a little more costly, but down in the long run, you uh, save money. So all these things can be done to uh, help minimize the effects of natural disasters. One near and dear to our business is ensuring that all water damage devices are replaced and not assumed to be in working order just because once the power comes back on, someone flicks a switch and says everything's fine and works. Well, years later, particularly with salt water, the corrosion can lead to shorting, fires, and other dangers. So all these technologies, when employed, can work to reduce outages, save lives, and protect homes. The addition of, cell of these remote sensing, computing, and computing technologies all come at a cost. It's mainly in terms of interoperability and also one which I'll mention in a, mention in a minute, cybersecurity. We constantly ask our devices to do more. We put more technology into them, both in terms of internal functionality and their interactions with our de other devices and an operating environment around them. In order for us to successfully integrate technology to mitigate the impact of future storms, we need to ensure interoperability. I know that as part of NEMA, we're working on the American National Standard that should be finalized this month that provides guidelines for interoperability and testing. So when a grid operator installs a product, it'll function as expected during a crisis, but it will also be able to communicate to other devices. The final point I'd like to make is about cybersecurity, and I wish Congressman King, who's very involved in that, were here to hear this. But it would be criminal for us to spend all of our time and effort making the grid more resilient to the forces of nature, but not resilient to the effects of a cyber attack. One of the strategies kicked around is that the best time for any of our enemies to attack would be in conjunction with a cyber attack and a future storm like Sandy. They could all use the effect of the storms to multiply the impact of the cyber attack. So we've been equally diligent both in terms of natural and man-made threats to the grid. We must be diligent in terms of cyber protection as well. It's generally accepted that the electrical grid, which is really nothing more than a patchwork that was constructed over the past, past century, is antiquated. It does not utilize the technologies available to make it more efficient and resilient, and it's time that we address this need and begin the process, which is not an overnight one, of rebuilding the grid.
Thank you very much, and we're going to entertain questions after Brett, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. And by the way, Don, thanks for uh, reminding me that uh, we are probably within a week or two coming out with this new harmonization and interoperability uh, standard that will ensure that when an electrical device is bought by utility and used, it will harmonize and work with all the other products. I believe that's the first coming out very soon, and thanks for reminding me of that. You know, as I mentioned earlier, Brett Benner is the president in electric, of the Electrical Safety Foundation International, and with more than 100 deaths, that's only in the United States from, uh, the la from uh, Sandy, some of which were the result of accidental electrocution, uh, the storm further emphasizes the need for electrical safety. Now, I'd like to uh, ask Brett to come up here and make a few comments, and then we'll open up the floor to you. Great. Thank you, Evan. Um, I wanted to bring this back to a, a more of a personal level for everybody in the room in terms of, of looking at things from a health and safety uh, point of view. We started to get I into the comments, and some of the, the, um, uh, the comments were about health and safety, and I think that's very important with this process. Many of us forget that uh, electricity is uniquely unforgiving. The fact that you can't see it, can't smell it, I hope you don't, can't taste it, but it's something that's unique in the fact that it can hurt you if you don't, if you don't know it's there. So a lot of times we see uh, w with natural disasters, this includes uh, Superstorm Sandy, this includes winter storms, uh, and this includes the tornadoes we saw in Oklahoma recently. Uh, we need to remember that those down power lines do kill people. Uh, there's been a couple instances reported of people stepping on them and not realizing it was there. Uh, they're going down in their basements that are flooded. Uh, they're actually energized water uh, down in those basements and they actually kill people that way. Um, but some of the things we've been seeing that were unique to Superstorm Sandy, Sandy and, and the environment that we live in today is the fact that a lot of portable generators are being used. Um, it usually wasn't a problem, but now they're so available at the Home Depots and those kind of uh, places in the world that they're being hooked up and they're being hooked up incorrectly. So you have two problems. On the electrical side of things, you've got something called backfeed. If you don't hook them up correctly, uh, they can kill your linemen uh, that are out there thinking that the power is off and not energized. Uh, if you plug these things in incorrectly, you can actually power your, almost your whole neighborhood. Uh, and a guy can come in and work on those lines and get himself hurt. Uh, and there's been many times where people have, uh, have really gotten themselves and their neighbors killed, um, and it's an unfortunate thing. On the flip side, uh, we look at carbon monoxide that's, that's produced by these gas-operated uh, portable electrical generators. And uh, there was 12 deaths uh, alone in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut from Superstorm Sandy. And there's simple things like putting generators in their house, leaving them running overnight unsupervised, um, putting them too close to a window so the carbon monoxide comes into the home. So these are things that you don't think about when a storm pops up. But in reality, everybody in this room, when the, I get a lot of people that say, what do you do? Um, you know, what, what's your job? And I tell them, when the power goes out, that's usually the stuff that we do. And you realize how vulnerable you are without energy. You can't have your cell phone, computers, and every other technology that's out there. You realize that, that everything kind of goes back to electricity. And so it's really important to remember that it is dangerous if it's misused. And most people have no clue. Um, and I think that that starts with the fact that, you know, our industry itself relies on codes and standards to really make sure that the stuff behind the walls and the ceilings and everything else that, that feeds those devices that you use on a daily basis um, are safe. And so when you're rebuilding, a lot of the things that we've heard, anecdotal evidence that we heard, a lot of folks are coming in and, and they're a, a general contractor, let's say. They come in and they say, yeah, th this, this device is fine. Uh, like Don had mentioned, it, it fires up, it looks like everything's fine, all the buttons glow, and it seems like it's working fine. Uh, unique to this storm was the salt water issue. But it, typically, when it comes to anything that came from Katrina or Sandy or anything else, anytime water gets in these electrical components and the circuitry that's, that, that's designed to keep them safe uh, is usually uh, compromised. And if that's the case, uh, those things might not be safe at the beginning, but four or five years down the road, those become fire hazards uh, that people unknowingly are putting in their house or keeping in their house. Uh, in addition, it's also important to, to educate the insurers who are coming out and saying this is something that should be replaced, maybe shouldn't be replaced. You've got to educate those folks to the level that they understand uh, what this device is capable of with, withstanding uh, and what it's not. Um, some of the other points, I, I think pre-storm, you have a lot of folks that are going out and buying these portable generators and don't know what they're doing. During the storm, you've got some issues with people going into their flooded basements, uh, turning on things that they shouldn't turn on. Um, but I think post-storm is really where we can make a big impact with educating people on what they should and shouldn't do. Um, like, the, uh, you know, like the previous presenters have said, 
people kind of revert back to what, what they need. And they don't act sometimes with the most sane of brain when they're trying to provide for their family and their children. And they're doing things that are just intrinsically not safe. Uh, and it's important that, that as you're getting this stuff fixed, as you're getting these electrical components, both on the residential side and the industrial side, that you're looking at the opportunity to upgrade these systems. Uh, because safety at the core of everything that we do, the codes and standards, how those things are written, safety is at the core of why those things are in, in, introduced and, and why these devices are actually being rolled out. Uh, I look at it as an opportunity to upgrade the homes that are currently available, get the new technologies in them to keep them safe from fire and, and electrocution and shock. Uh, those are all, all, obviously big things that we've, we're concerned about. But as an organization, uh, there's just simple things that you can do to prevent the deaths and injuries that we've been seeing. And there's things that you can do to improve the future uh, as you're upgrading these systems. Uh, one of the stats that I th I'd like you all to kind of think about yourself, most of the homes that we live in today were built before the 60s. Typically that code or that standard that was written at that time and adopted at the time only allow for one or two outlets a room. If you think about how many extension cords you have underneath your computer, um, how many power surge adapters you have in your computer, and I look around and I see a lot of people smiling, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the world we live in. There's an opportunity to make those homes all up and down, the, the, those homes that were affected, those businesses that were affected, to make sure that those things are up to current standards and codes to make sure you're safe for the future, um, but more importantly, to make sure that you're in present day, you're able to use the, the technology as it's meant to be used. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and I'll hand it back over to Evan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So it's a little awkward. I'm going to try to move this out of the way. Uh, I've got to point out, and I was just thinking about this. Uh, Brett runs the Electrical uh, Safety Foundation International. It's an independent organization. Uh, but it was started, and I was just thinking about that, by NEMA and the Consumer Product Safety Commission, well, I don't know, way back. And, uh, so I'm kind of proud of that, and I'm proud of what they're doing, and uh, they're out there on their own now, and they're really making a difference, saving lives. Well, I'd like to, you know, you've got two of the world's experts up here now. So uh, I want to open it up to questions, and uh, I, I will start off by pointing out two things. First, you know, they talked, Don talked about the fires that burned the homes down, and Brett talked about uh, electrocution. And a lot of people don't understand our fault circuit interrupters. You know, we understand GFCIs now because, you know, they're the ones that kick off that are always around, you know, your bathrooms or places like that where there's water. But the art for circuit interrupter is kind of a new product, uh, I don't know, what, four or five years? It hadn't been out all that long. Uh, and they've got them now that uh, you can put into, you know, replace a circuit with it or you can put it in now. And I believe this is, uh, Don's got one of the first companies that have come out where you can replace a socket and do that. What it says is most of the fires are started by arc fault, means sparks on wires, and these things stop that. But I don't want to just leave it there uh, because we also want to talk about, uh, you know, what we could do in microgrids and many other things. I've got to also comment because I heard uh, Congressman King say it and I heard Don say it, that, you know, in New York, they didn't know where the power is out. Those smart technologies are available today. We've got it right now that when your power goes out, some places you have to pick up the phone to try to call the utility. If you've got smart meters and things like that, you automatically know that the power is out and you can reroute it around there. You don't have to have somebody out there guessing where you are. I'm gonna open this up to questions and try to move this if it will move, because it's a little awkward. Please, first question. Jamie Clark, Department of Energy. I work in the uh, Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. And my question is, obviously, a lot of the recommendations that you're making make perfect sense. But how do you balance these improvements against people's reluctance to have to pay more for uh, the cost of these safety improvements? as well as the state regulatory authorities that you have to deal with who are kind of the watchdogs for the ratepayers to ensure that they aren't being unduly taken advantage of. I mean, I agree that what you propose is a good thing, but at the end of the day, if the insurance company tells the homeowner 
that we will only rebuild to the, what the previous standard was, and that's it. The rest has to come out of your pocket. How do you sell the public that these are, it's, it's in their best interest to do this? Um, Congressman King said the last question's the toughest. <laughs> I think we'll deal with the first one. Uh, I'll tell a quick story, first of all. I mean, part of it is standard. Uh, when the GFCI, which as Evan mentioned, most people are familiar with, you see it in your bathrooms and kitchens, and it's mandated by code. Took a long time to adapt. Uh, Leviton had one of the first GFIs, went to a Sears store. We had a guy with a barrel of water, uh, a hair dryer that was electric, dropped it in on a GFI, and he would put his hand in to show that it worked. It was one of our well-paid engineers. He had very curly hair, though. Uh, but the problem was that everybody looked at it, was amazed, and no one bought it. And the reason was the GFCI receptacle was probably 10 times. I mean, a basic receptacle is 35 cents, so at Home Depot, maybe it's 70 cents for a simple receptacle. This was probably selling in those days for about 8 $9 a piece. And people said, that's terrific. It would protect me if someone dropped an electrical device in the bathtub or one of my kids, but I'm not putting it in because why bother? And it wasn't until code mandated it that now GFIs are basically ubiquitous. They're everywhere in your home you can think of. We hope that will happen with arc fault as well. Arc fault uh, interruption, uh, tamper-proof devices, which are devices with little windows on them so a kid cannot stick a pencil into a receptacle or put his mouth up against it and get a mouth burn or electrocution. That code was passed and I believe it's six years and some states still are not enforcing it. And I mean it seems so simple and a tamper-proof receptacle is probably 90 cents to protect a kid, uh, not installed, the receptacle itself. So a lot of this is very difficult because people are reluctant to spend the money. And I don't know where they would get the money from uh, if the insurance company doesn't pay it. But again, if the wall's ripped out and the electrician's there, the cost of the device itself is probably somewhat minimal as compared to the cost of the labor. So once the electrician is there putting in receptacles, it's not that much more money to make the house safe with an arc fault device or a GFCI or a tamper-proof receptacle. So I guess the answer is if the electrician's there, it's not that much more. And otherwise, you might have to just say it's better to have a better product. I mean, you put a surge strip on your computer and other systems in your home with electronics because the cost if you have a lightning surge to replace your TV or anything that's electronic is, is great, and if it happens once and you didn't do it, the next time you're a little smarter. So I think we all, I mean, all of these things cost money. There's no denying it. But it's going to build a better system and a more resilient system down the road. And of course, one of the problems, if you don't have storms for years, people say, why bother? It never happens. You know, it's the same how many people and again, I lived through this in New York, people had generators, but they never tested them, they never maintained them. So now they said, great, I'll drag it out of the garage and forget that they put it in the basement or you know places they shouldn't. But it didn't even work because they hadn't tested it and maintained it. So they had spent the money, they didn't do the cheap maintenance of running it you know, every two months or so and just testing it. And then when they needed it, it failed. So. I guess that's the best answer I could give. Yeah, and if, if I could, the uh, you know the other two things, and I wish the congressman were here right now, but I know he's got other things to do. But you know, one of the things that Congress does for us is they give us incentives, tax incentives, and things like that to drive the prices down for the consumers, so that they can put these new uh, you know products in the homes and make themselves safer. On the industrial side, we have a thing we call energy savings performance contracts, and actually we're trying to work with White House right now to. Uh, kick that out and mandate it because what it really does is it requires that, uh, well, companies like Leviton and others will come together and they will build the product and take the money back out of the savings from energy efficiency. That's a very important thing. It says the government's not putting out money. It's paying for itself because we're making things more efficient. And again, it's paid for by the difference in the money saved. 
So uh, next question, please. Just real quick, a follow-up to what uh, Don just said. I'm Jerry Petrella with Senator Schumer's office, and I, I'm just wondering, I'm a native Long Islander, and they know very well sort of those neighborhoods of the congressman and you were talking about, uh, and know the history of LIPA, um, their lack of investment in infrastructure. And, and so sort of a two-part question. One, there's quite a bit of money flowing into New York now to rebuild folks' homes. Um, I'm not aware, I mean, we wrote the law, but I'm not sure that we specifically put in that CDBG, you know, CDBG section that, you know, it shall be spent in a way where you're making sure that those standards are being uh, enforced. W on an industry, because I'm a layperson when it comes to this, on an industry level, I is that something that every electrician just knows to do? So in other words, if, if someone ha only got $20,000 to rebuild their home from the insurance company, but the federal government through the city or the state is now coming in saying, I'm going to give you an extra 40, maybe to elevate your home, maybe to, you know, cover the gap that the insurance company didn't cover. Does the electrician, does the contractor know to put those things in place? Is it industry standard? Do we have to update codes or laws? Do we have to, when we're writing these bills or in, in future bills, make sure that those things are mandated? The, the second part question across the board is, <coughs> um, you mentioned the uh, Energy Act of 2007 and how that promoted smart grid technology. Obviously, that didn't make its way down to LIPA. Um, what y you guys are at the at the forefront of, of these technologies. Why is it that they aren't making those investments? Is it a is it a cost structure? You know, is it a, is it cost prohibitive for them? Are they? Is it just a leadership issue? And what is it going to take to to get them to do that? I mean, if the technology is out there, is it just a matter of them making the investment, um, or are there real strategical hurdles in in implementing that across a system that powers homes, you know, for three and a half million people? I, I can follow. I wanted to follow up on the the first question. And I can answer this to the first question that you had. So, w with the GFI when it was introduced in the I think late '60s, early '70s. Um, we've seen a 50% reduction in electrocutions. Um, when you bring this back to the personal level, when you're, when you're designing a home, your, 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 your wife or my boss is usually looking at you know, countertops and, and kitchen design and everything else. You don't think about the safety implications. Safety is a hard sell. I'm not going to sit here and say it, it's an easy sell by any means. But you don't ever expect to be in an accident on the road. It's not something you plan for. You weren't planning on the disaster. Uh, much like the senator had mentioned that, you know, you're not planning for this stuff. You can't long range. It's unexpected. And that's when this stuff comes into play. And to answer some of your questions, the, lo the most recent codes and standards, as long as they're adopted at the state level or the local level, you're going to have those technologies. Those technologies have been vetted over the, over the code cycle itself. It's happened over the last uh, 100 years. So GFCIs were introduced. Believe me, the home builders didn't want to see those things introduced because it raised costs. Um, what it comes down to is, is if it makes sense and the statistics back it up and you have the research to show that it works, the insurance companies are all about AFCIs because they stop homes from burning down. And you only get a one, you get a, it's a one shot opportunity to, to invest that in your home's electrical system because once the walls and stuff like that are up, it's, it's, it's so cost prohibitive, it's crazy. So things are going to hopefully be built to the standard. That's, that's to answer your question. But that standard has been vetted through the opponents, and it really has been vetted through the industry to make sure that these things are sound. Um, and no technology is going to be foolproof, but when you start looking at the statistics and you start realizing that, wow, we can prevent, we've prevented 50% of the electrocutions that we've seen since the 70s. Just by keeping those things in your bathroom, that, that how many, uh, let's be honest, how many times do you really test those things? I know you don't do it once a month. And on the flip side, with those AFCIs, either, either at the outlet or in the, can, the, the code, pan, the, excuse me, the, uh, the panel box, those things are, are keep it simple, stupid. You don't have to do anything with it. They're going to keep you safe. They're going to prevent, you know, for, for you putting a picture up on a wall, they're going to help you uh, not start a fire there. I mean, these things are going to be with your home and the people that you sell your home to for the next 40, 50, 60 years. And the stats don't lie. They, they speak to how safe these devices are. Um, and it all comes back to the codes and standards, which you as a lay person or you as a consumer in your home and your wife don't have to worry about that stuff because the codes and standards are there to kind of back you up in case something happens. That's why safety is kind of paramount to our industry. Things are designed to keep you safe when you most need them. Don, you want to come out there? Yeah. Um, the answer to the question, too, is all of the above. Um, 
there are codes and standards, but it's a question of the enforcement of codes and standards, uh, which is an issue in any case. Um, just like wearing seat belts, you know, did you buckle up? Well, if you didn't, and you have an accident, you have a problem. If you get stopped by a cop, you have a problem. If the homeowner repairs his own home and goes to Home Depot and just buys a receptacle, uh, he can put anything in. And it's only if there was an inspection. Uh, some of the homes would not be re-energized on Long Island, and that was a problem actually in getting some of the homes back. They had a lack of inspectors, and every home had to be inspected electrically. Uh, before they would power up because powering up a house that was improperly wired could cause a fire there, could cause a problem, as uh, someone said earlier, down the line. If you energize my house and it's affected your house and you haven't done the proper repairs, uh, we could have a problem as a result of your repair, not mine. So um, inspection is critical, but a lot of homes were not inspected because they didn't have total devastation. The ones that were inspected uh, were where the whole panel was wiped out, the whole house was out for probably several months. So it's an inspection, it's getting homeowner awareness. We as a company, NEMA as an organization, uh, we have a guide after every flood or area that's hit that we send out uh, that talks about home wiring and what should be done if your home's been flooded. And as I said, unfortunately, most people, when it dries out, plug something in, hey, it worked, you know, or I'll do it later and they never do it. And then five years later, as Brent said, there's corrosion, there's a short, and you have a real problem. So it's, it's awareness, and we're all doing what we can to educate. It's a cost factor, uh, and we're trying to keep the cost of receptacles and safety as cheap as possible and a plug for us and every other manufacturer. Most electrical wiring devices that are in your home, you're probably there when you moved in and they'll be there when you move out. So our replacement market is when your wife, Brent's boss, decides to redecorate. Uh, but otherwise, devices that work, people usually don't replace them unless they replace them with a new technology. So a switch gets replaced for a lighting control, Maybe you built, have a kid in the house, so you put in a tamper-proof receptacle. But otherwise, they work too well and last too long. But well, I'm sorry to say we're out of time. Oh, I, I, uh, I want to thank Congressman uh, King for participating with us today, Don Hindler, who came in from uh, New York specifically to talk about this, and Brett Brenner, who's always working with us on safety, and I hope you, uh, you get to see him everywhere. I want to remind everybody we've got a lot of materials in the back that talk about everything that we've done. Uh, put together by the world's experts and uh, and remind you that uh, you know one of the things they talked about here today were the smart technologies if you've got the smart technologies you can mitigate the next storms by routing around it by detecting where the power is out we talked about microgrids and i would tell you in the materials back there you'll see that a microgrid uh, they can take care of those critical uh, first responders hospitals and so on and, uh, and a good example, I think, that I saw in those books back there were New York uh, University in Princeton. They didn't lose the power, and they had a microgrid in there. So thanks again for joining us today. Pick up the materials, and uh, thank you again, and look out for uh, the storm this afternoon.